Still here. Thank you, everybody, for coming uh, to uh, Spinning with Tilly Walden. I'm Warren Bernard, the uh, executive director of SPX and a somewhat comics historian, interviewing Tilly Walden. Last year, you won which Ignatz Award? I won uh, Promising New Talent and Outstanding Artist. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we're here, a uh, uh, most unusual couple up on stage, yes. to say the least. Uh, spinning with Tilly Walden. Now, for those of you, um, Tilly came to my house and she asks, do you know about a uh, comic that ran in the United States with Tilly in it? And I happen to have seven of the eight issues of Tilly the Toiler. Spelled my way, T-I-L-L-I-E. So and we have all kinds of other pictures, but that's the one we used. All right, so uh, we want to start out with just an anecdote, okay? So I got a chance to meet Tilly at TCAF last year. Um, was it only last year? It was only last oh year, God. yeah. And uh, so I woke up to the Avery Hill t um, table. Are either Ricky or Dave here? Okay, there's Ricky. Ricky's over there. Um, by the way, uh, Avery Hill has got her first three graphic novels. The CBLDF table has got spinning. Mm -hmm. Okay, you'll be able to pick up both after the show. So I went up to the table, and Ricky introduces me and points down to the, to the table. And I, I look at this book, and I go, oh, this is the great room of the Library of Congress. And Tilly is like, what? Okay, how did you know that? And this is the great room of the Library of Congress. And I introduce myself, and, and she goes, oh, you're the guy with the collection. And I was like, how did you know? Anyway, so We're both looking at each other like, are you seeing into my soul? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> who is this person? Right, who is this person? So, and, uh, and we talked, and, and you went to the Library of Congress, but... It wasn't like... It was this weird... I, I never connected to the dots until you said that to me, but I, <laughs> I... No, seriously, I hadn't, because no one had ever brought that up before. But I did go to the Library of Congress once as a teenager, and it just, like, totally transfixed me. And I remember looking at it and memorizing every detail that I could possibly hold on to. And obviously, you, you lose some stuff in memory. I'm not, I'm not a freak like that. But, 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 but you can see that there, there were totally aspects that I completely kept... Um, and I remember I was with a group. I was my orchestra had gone to DC, um, you and play cello, I play right? cello. And I lost my group be of students because I was so busy looking at the ceiling. And a, a nice woman helped me find them later. But I, yeah, I totally held on to it. And then when I yeah. finally sat down to draw the end of summer, and I was working on the cover, I just knew what it needed to look like. But I had no idea that I was recreating the Library of Congress until you brought it up. And then there it is again, in the first panel. <laughs> so, um, and, and there was someone else that you also held, and let's talk about uh, your dad when you were younger gave you Little Nemo and Slumberland. Yes, yeah, so if you're not familiar, Little Nemo and Slumberland is a comic strip by Windsor McKay, and when I was, I don't know, maybe six, my dad got me the big uh, edition with the Sunday pages, Right. Yes. and I used to lay it on the floor and sit on it while I would read it because I was that little and the book was that big. Um, and I mean, just look at the content of the story. It's so obvious how it inspired me. And there we go. Yeah. And this is from which book? This is from my second book. I love this part. Um, and I, I think I knew from that very young age that space and geography and people and relationships could all be played with. There was nothing that had to exist exactly like reality. And, and what's interesting to me is, is that you didn't go back, like when you drew, when you sat down to do these graphic yeah. novels, you didn't go back and refresh your memory. Oh, no, okay. no. I just so let, it, it had been sitting inside me waiting to, waiting to come out. Right, which was totally cool, all right? Yeah. Went, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, sh it shows the power of partial photographic memories, okay? Yeah, well, and I, I just think that I, or I well, memories. Photogra photographic memories and that I made emotional connections to these. You know, I made an right. emotional connection to the Library of Congress, and I was very emotionally connected to all of Windsor McKay's work, and so it was really deep, deep for me. Right, and, and on Windsor McKay's work, the other, the other thing you got was, you know, this, this first one, uh, if you look at this, the, the people are large and the city is small, but what it goes through a lot of your work is the opposite. Yes. Where the people are small and your spaces are vast. This is from... If you haven't read it, this is from uh, On a Sunbeam. It was about 20 parts. 20 chapters. 20 chapters online. Each chapter was, what, mm. 9 or 10 pages? I mean. Oh, no. Much longer. No. They were, they're, they're in varying lengths. They get, a couple chapters get to like 60 pages or something. And, and if, if you want to see long. the impact of 
space on someone's art, you need to go out. These are these are all from On a Sunbeam. I think it's the first chapter when she Yeah, arrived. this is okay. chapter one. Yeah, it's all for free online. Yes, and so to you know talk about your your sense of space in, in these drawings. Now, we'll get to spinning later, which sure, is sure. different. Okay? Yeah, but absolutely. I, I'd like for you to talk about this. Well, I always knew that I was interested in vast spaces. I always really liked feeling very small. Uh, and I still really like that sensation when you're in a really big place, how, how relative you feel to that. And I, I always felt like there was something that other people weren't picking up on, where whenever I was standing next to a tree, I would look at that tree and I'd be like, this tree is massive and I feel like no one else around me is really admiring how big this tree is. You know, I was always yeah. really hyper aware of how big I was compared to other things. I mean, even this room, if I was drawing this room to scale right now, yeah. we'd be pretty small, it's pretty wide. And so when I was thinking about creating my own world, I really felt like, oh, well, I'm just gonna take that sensation that I love and multiply it because I, I just love, it feels like there's so much to explore when you create big spaces. Right, and especially right. when you create big spaces and partially hide them. So like that image on the, on the left, you know, there's lots of windows and doors that I filled in black that you can't see inside, but you get the sensation that there is a lot more there. Yeah, right. You know, yeah, yeah. it's this feeling of exploration uh, and of this idea that space uh, expands past what we see. And, and for me, okay, the one of the elevator shaft, I'm a diehard acrophobic, okay, and I'm looking at What does that so mean? Fear of heights. Oh, no, oh, I love heights. <laughs> <laughs> I love being up high. I would totally just like jump off a cliff if it was safe. Uh, I'll watch. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, watching, you know, the, the, the sense of space here for someone who's acrophobic, it's like, oh my God. Oh, is like, it making you tense a little bit? Well, yeah. A little okay. nervous? But see, I love that. That's those sensations. Whenever I'm going, you know, when you're in a glass elevator and you can you can really look down, those sensations are always the ones that make me feel like wholly myself. I feel very tapped into yeah. the environment, into into the world when I when I'm aware of the space around me. Well, in fact, on that, have you ever done anything like skydiving or you know, like what is the most extreme height? You know, it it sounds like it's part of your psyche. So I, I just <laughs> wanted to ask, you know, what, what has there ever been an experience that helped reinforce this? Oh, I mean, sure. I used to, I went to high school in, in Austin, Texas, and it was a very big school because Texas has a lot of space. And uh, I would just sort of casually go on the roof um, oh, okay. to go, I don't know, experience being up high. Um, and I, there, were, there were, I mean, kids would go up there to like smoke and do those sorts of things, but I was more interested in just being on the roof. <laughs> um, that's, that's don't a, they have a big tower? In the center of campus? Yes, that is a very famous tower because that was where the, where shooting, the shooting was. Yeah, yes, yeah. no, I never went in that tower. In fact, everyone in Austin is a little freaked out by that tire, by, tire, by that tower uh, since then. But no, I mean, other than when I was very little, going to my dad's office building in New York City and being so high up that I could feel the building swaying. You know, other yeah. than that, I don't think I've ever really sought it out, but I've, I know I've always been interested in it. Okay, all right. I, I was just curious. Yeah, oh, yeah. I did skydiving and I... I Oh, I should, that. though. My God. So I, I chose these two. I want to start with the one uh, to the left of everybody, okay? And I want to talk about, we talked about Windsor McKay and you, but I'd like to talk about Miyazaki. Sure. Okay. And, you know, for those who don't know, Princess Mononoke, Howl's Moving Castle. Spirited Away. Spirited Away. My Neighbor exactly. Totoro. I could yeah. go on. And so I saw the one on the left, and I was like, this is the Miyazaki panel. Really? Okay? Yeah. Yeah. It just jumped up out at me like that. Well, I feel like Miyazaki is this, this just lovely blend of, of real things coming together in magical ways. So like, you know, f obviously fish are real and buildings are real and, and the love of these characters is real, but the way they come together is very unique and somewhat magical. And I feel like that's what happens in a lot of Studio Ghibli movies. It's like you're, you're dealing with real characters and real emotions and settings that feel real, but like, oh, there's a spirit and oh, there's a Totoro and oh, by the way, we can fly and oh, by the way, the castles float in the sky. You know, it's just like, yeah. it all comes together in this really natural but very magical way and I feel like that's what I'm evoking in that image there is that well also th those koi are actually spaceships they are spaceships okay so you uh, talk, talk about that we'll get more into on a uh, you know on a sunbeam in, in sunbeam. detail yeah but just talk about you know conceiving of a spaceship that's in the shape and moves like a fish well sure I I have always been interested in in machinery that acts like it's natural so uh, you know, I, I think uh, machinery is uh, and 
and cars and planes and trains and all that is very interesting, but I'm, I'm also much more interested in how organic things move and exist in space. And so when I, I mean, let's be honest, when I was first designing the fish spaceships, I did not know how to make spaceships, but I knew how to draw fish, so I was like, cool, well, <laughs> problem solved. <laughs> um, that, was, that, was, that was the main reason when I did it, but then obviously got a little deeper, um, and I realized that this idea of a fish moving through the water would be this wonderful way to evoke moving through space because I feel like so much of space media is like really cold and hard and the way we see machines move through space is just so stiff. Yes, yes. And space stiff, is so yeah. cool. It's full yeah. of stars and planets and explosions and all this amazing stuff and I feel like characters and things should be moving through it as if moving through water. Right, yeah, and when, when you see um, like the old Apollo footage as mm -hmm. they rotate they're very, they move very stiffly. I know, okay. well, and you know, in reality, that's all we can really do that's right, in yeah. space. But I'm a cartoonist. Right. I don't you need to deal with want. reality. Yeah, right, exactly. You know, I can, <laughs> no, but seriously, that's, that's so much of the power of it. And I also think that in a lot of the Miyazaki films, uh, the way cars move and the way the people, the, you know, especially cars, I don't know who here knows what I'm talking about, but like they move in a very kind of alive way. Yeah. And that yeah. really stuck with me. Um, cool. The way and, the machines can do that. And, uh, you know, but we'll get more into the artistic stuff in a second. I, I also wanted to explore, in a, most of your works, mm. talk about love, sexual identity, desire, okay? And, oh, sure. You know, all, all the, those things that are clearly very near and dear to you because, for instance, it's, it's through spinning to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. It is definitely through on a sunbeam. Oh, yeah. Okay? Oh, yeah. And so uh, talk about that and talk about how, how you feel about these things and how you integrate them into your work. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because like these two images especially, I, I've realized now that a lot of my most intricate and sort of loose, or yeah, maybe my, just my most interesting pages have to do with love in some way. Um, it seems like whenever I'm dealing with that emotion, love or desire or relationships, that's when I really take my compositions and my art to like another place. Um, and I think it's because I really take those ideas very seriously and I think they are emotions uh, worthy of exploration beyond just a simple panel. You know, I don't think, I don't know, I mean I know that you can uh, evoke uh, love and desire in a simple six panel grid and, and do that super effectively but when I think about how I feel about those emotions it goes so far beyond a, you know just a grid and uh, and just a casual page and I also you know in these especially I I really notice how much everything overlaps and when I think about uh, sexuality and my own my own sexual orientation, I think a lot about sort of overlapping identities and how a lot of people think being gay is like, you know, there's Tilly and then there's my gayness and they're kind of these two separate things. Um, they forget that me being gay is very fluid in who I am and that it, it, it comes out in different aspects of, uh, of how I exist in the world. And it's just, it's not like this one little entity in me. It's, it's in all of me and it flows uh, in a very interesting way. And I try and really uh, bring that out in my art, especially when I'm depicting uh, lesbian relationships, because that's, I mean, obviously that's my wheelhouse, that's what I know. Um, and it's, and I think I have this secret desire to sort of change this perception that, I, or just to, to show people that that's how being gay feels to me. It feels, it feels very fluid and it feels very integrated in who I am and, and not like a separate entity. And so I try to bring that out in the compositions. And, and also in terms of thematically, mm -hmm. um, when you when you talk about particularly what happened to you in spinning, mm, okay, yeah. and the whole process of, of coming out and what happened, oh, sure, uh, during that time frame, and then then also sort of the in the other works like in On a Sunbeam, it's like these people should not have maybe been in those relationships, okay, even though you know it was all women and things like that, it mm -hmm. should have been understood, but it wasn't understood. And so there's you lots of you? there's well there's lots of intricacies, right? It's yeah. just it's so not black and white. And you know my own experiences coming coming out and coming into my own um, have totally shaped how uh, how I make things and how I tell these stories. And it's uh, it's hard to sort of sometimes it's hard to follow your own threads sometimes because other people right. in a way see the themes in my work more than I do. Because when I sit down to draw, I, I go through I often don't have full intentions in my mind. I'm just sort of going with well, my instinct. And, and I was going to ask you about how much is conscious for, you know, do you have any Oh God, it's about so not conscious. Okay, it right. so isn't. I mean, yeah. everything I've made to date, I have never made it with 
with any idea of, of a final product or of how it relates to my other work. I think a lot of people, uh, well, I don't, actually don't know, I should maybe ask some cartoonists if they think about their work in terms of their body of work. But I really feel each, everything I've done has been individual and I never think about how they work together. But you bring this up and you, you say that there's all these common themes and I'm like, oh, <laughs> cool. I meant to do that. Oh, okay, sheer genius. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so why don't we, um, uh, you know, you were talking about how some of you most um, intimate things come out when you're thinking about relationships, things like that. And I, and I purposely chose this piece, and she brought... To just give you an idea of the scale, I have it. Y'all okay, are so welcome to come up is, and flip through this sketchbook after. It's, it's pen and ink, and you didn't pencil this in. This just, <laughs> No. Yeah, right. Well, because that's, that takes so much of the fun out of it. Because doing something like this... I can still remember where I started drawing. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's, it really is, it's, I started in the upper right-hand corner. It's like exploring for me, yeah. you know? It's, it's like someone walking around a new city, only for me, I'm exploring an image, uh, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm exploring my own ability in, in this kind of page. And by the way, speaking of ability, and you just told me this right, right before, okay? What did I tell, tell you? Tell everybody how long it took you just to do that one page. Hold it feels it like a long time. No, 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 Defi a long time is relative. <sighs> About tell? four hours. Watching, t watching TV and uh, drawing. So all, my, all the sketches in this book, I, I always watch TV while I do it. We were talking about flow so earlier. So three four hours watching television. But that's okay. how I draw. Yeah, no, no, I, I understand that. And I, I've got, there's one more in here. Oh, yeah, so here, this is this oh, one, isn't it? No, that's another no. one. This is a different one here. Let me find, okay. I have that one in here. This is a great sketchbook. I want that Not to toot my own horn, but <laughs> it's very nice. Here it is. So there's the one on the right. And that was, now because you had to break out the watercolors, was that? These are, the these are markers. Oh, so markers. the way I deal oh. with these kinds of pages is I always do the color first. And okay, people ask me so much about Tilly, how do you pick colors? I literally only have five markers. And those are the only colors that I have. So those are always the palette that I use. No, seriously, that's how my palette is always so cohesive. It's all that I have. These markers are really expensive. They're Copic markers. Um, and so I only have like red, yellow, pink, purple hues. Right. And so I just kind of lay it down, and it's kind of like my my the jazz portion. So you did and then the, I do the ink over it. So you without, do the color first. I do the color first, and then I do the ink over it, and I and I usually try and notice where white spaces have been left, and think, okay, that white space kind of looks like a leg, so I'll draw a leg, you know, and then that leg will be attached to a person. And now, as you know, I've told you, I have no artistic ability whatsoever. <laughs> okay, but it, it's very interesting to me that yes. on a piece like that. That that would be almost the reverse of what I would have expected to have heard. I think it's the reverse of what most people would do. Okay. But I think it's a very uh, healthy way for an artist to work because it forces you to kind of work backwards and to lay the color down with some intention. Interesting. Yes. It's, so, a, it's a fun challenge. Now, do you do any of your coloring, um, like for instance, on a sunbeam, which we'll get to in a second. Sure, that's, that's digital coloring. So that's all digital coloring, but were all those pages um, strictly all the pen and ink work was analog and then Absolutely. coloring was digital? Yeah, yeah. I, I prefer working traditionally. I, I think I wanted to do on a sunbeam with digital coloring because I kind of wanted to learn how to, digital, how to do digital coloring because I'd never really done it before. And... Uh, and I, I like it. It's yeah, fine. Yeah. I, I, pr I appreciate how it looks. But at the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a traditional girl. It's, it's what I like to do. So do you work in other kinds of color modes, like whether it's gouache or watercolor? Watercolor. Or? Watercolor was my first passion for color. So my first couple books have, have watercolor in them. I mean, there's, there's that original just sitting over there. I'm giving that to you for the other thing. Oh. But that has watercolor on it. Um, so, that's, so that's just ink and watercolor. That's, uh, and I, I uh, do it the not professional way where I just watercolor over my lines. Uh, so my line art is oh, not we super. Get for one. Well, I didn't like that page. I mean, oh, you've got to draw on the back the of the reject, paper. Okay. It's so funny. I'll sell people originals and they're like, there's another page on the back. And it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot by, I drew that there. And by the way, thank you for this. You're so okay. welcome. Uh, we hope to get more. Yes. But, uh, so this is going to be donated to the SPX Collection of the Library of Congress. I thought that'd be a good page for it, right? Don't you think? It's got some. I, I want. I want that page right there. You want that page? I can rip it out for you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, okay. So moving on. So on a sunbeam. Okay. Now, you know, I, I had read your first couple of books, and they had a certain expanse to them. 
but then nothing like this. Yeah, and I, I, was, I was about to say you created your own universe. All right? And this is my longest work to date. It's yes. longer than spinning. And this work, spinning, and the diary comics, which we're going to get into each one of them, were all being done at the same time. Well, not exactly. Well, sort of. Talk, talk about there the was like overlaps. there was an overlap. Yeah. Um, I was. F- Finishing? Oh, well, the diary comics were definitely going on through all of this. Um, and then I was like wrapping, spinning, and starting on a sunbeam. And you're, you know, spinning, I wanted, I wanted spinning to like be done. And my, you know, my publishers were like, you know, keep working. You know, they were really gently telling me to like stay strong and keep going. There's a, just a little more copy editing, editing to do. Um, so it ended up that I, I was drawing on a sunbeam. Um, and and doing some spinning, but it was really actually a fun way to work because I'd be like in the mornings I'd be like all right serious memoirist, and then in the evenings I'd be like all right space and trees and like <laughs> everything gay. It's gonna be so much fun. And, and, um, and by the way, you do this averaging like what ten hours of sleep a night? Yes, of course. He asked me like, okay, be real. How much sleep did you get during that time? And I was like, Warren, ten hours a night. Come on. <laughs> I no, I have to get it. Otherwise, I'm like not myself. And by the way, we were honored you stayed up late last night. Oh, I'm it. so tired. <laughs> I went to sleep right after the Ignatz Awards, you guys. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so, you know, she was up there. It was, I guess, around 11 o'clock at night. That yeah, was a lot. I'm, I'm there. Oh, my God, poor Tilly. Okay. That was a lot. The people who know me see me up at, like, 10 p.m., and they're like, I'm so sorry. I know this is hard for you. So so this is on a sunbeam. I want to point out the, the last panel here, speaking of Miyazaki. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And Howl's Mo- Mo- um, Moving Castle. Castle. Okay. I love that movie. And you know, so I, I was very struck about the world that you had created out in space mm. was actually, to a very certain extent, Earth-based in its design. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I felt like having Earth influences would be fine. I wasn't. I wasn't really hell bent on making this like a traditional sci-fi comic, and I also had no interest in that. Um, but I was also, so when I started designing, designing the world, I mean designing the world, I was in my, I was designing it as I was drawing it. Um, I didn't really like the idea that all my potential for, for world building would have to take place on planets. Yeah. You know, that's so boring. Yeah, sure. I don't want to have to go down to the planet. That's like so much movement for the characters to have to like go into a planet to like see some nice cathedral. And so I was like, oh, okay, well they're floating around space. So why don't I just put the cathedral just like floating in space. Well, why don't you give everybody a synopsis? Because it's, it's long and dense in many respects. Ah, uh, yes. And so a synopsis? It, it'd be Sounds good for people to, uh, to try to, because spinning, it's, it's self-contained. And I can describe that book in, yeah, in one like, sentence. In like three, min- three minutes. But On a Sunbeam was much more complex than anything you'd done before. Yes. So why don't you give describe. everybody a, a clue as to what it is they're going to get into when, and if you don't go out and read this, you're really missing something, okay? The artwork is unbelievable. This the is the hard is sell. Great. Yeah. No, um, no, no. And by the way, I get nothing for this. <laughs> well, you get to hang out with me. Oh, yes. Right. Um, On a Sunbeam is a, someone called it a space opera once, and that feels fairly accurate. Uh, the main, the, it follows the protagonist, Mia, uh, through sort of two threads in her life. One, when she is at a boarding school in space, of course, uh, and uh, another thread when she is a bit older and uh, living and working with this crew uh, of women and queer people as they uh, restore lost and forgotten buildings floating on the edges of space. And it follows Mia through her life and her relationships. It also is a pretty big cast. Um, and that's all I'm going to say because I don't want to. I want to spoil anything. Um, it's it's expansive, and you and you also use a whole bunch of different comics techniques. Like um, the bottom panel on the right hand side is there as they're walking through. You know, oh, getting on they're, the train. They're getting Field on trip. the train to go to the school. Um, who you know? Are there people that you looked at that may have you know filtered in, or is this something that was just you know Tilly was like. Oh, I'm just going to do this, okay? And you know, the Iron Age started in multiple different places around the world. And I was just curious whether or not there was anyone that you had read before that might have fed you these kinds of uh, establishment shots, as they would say in ah, the movie world. Interesting. Okay? Um, yeah, I think I think I mean I read a lot of manga, and and a lot of manga takes the time to do establishing shots in scenes um, that are usually very intricate, and I always sort of. Uh, took that in, but I also, you know, I don't, 
people, some people get very offended when I say this, but I can't help it uh, being true. I don't actually read comics anymore, really. And I, I wasn't when I was doing On a Sunbeam, and I haven't really for years, because I, I mean, comics is my full-time job. It is all that I do. So I watch movies, and I read books, and I, I can't really go near comics anymore, because it's, it's like, yeah, it's, it feels like I'm on the clock. Well, um, we'll so well, I don't think there is really a direct influence. Well, I think why don't of. we talk for a minute about, you know, what kind of movies do you watch? Okay. Um, I mean, so my mom used to work for HBO, um, and she has al- she has always been my guide in uh, TV and movies, and she likes really dark stuff. So we like we watched Fargo together, we watched The Wire, Six Feet Under, um, and and you know she's showed me all sorts of uh, old movies. Her she loves The Graduate, we watched that. Um, she loves The Cone Brothers, we watched that. Oh, yeah. um, uh, you know, just really great great films, really good influences, and we else and. And we have similar taste in books, so that helps too. And what, what kind of books? Oh my God, you guys, my favorite author, let me just tell you. Tana French, Irish mystery writer, my favorite author of all time. I'm really obsessed with crime and mystery books. Um, it's funny, I've never done that in my own comics, but it's like, right, it's yeah. literally all that I read. Um, that is the book that is up in my hotel room right now, is a Japanese murder mystery. Um, so it's all, but, I, but I, I think I love it so much because it's so different from what I do, and it's so refreshing to read stories that are new. Right, and, and getting back into, uh, into Honest Sunbeam, yes, yes. you have both this love mm. and desire, okay, and in, this, in these vast spaces, especially later in Honest Sunbeam, when the two women go off and, and they just go to these amazing different places. Yes. Sort of trying to escape. Yes. Don't okay. sit. No spoilers, Warren. Okay. No spoilers. <laughs> um, yes. No, absolutely. It's their, their love is very connected to these huge spaces. I mean, look at the drawing of them with the, with the trees. That, that, to me, screams their love even more than the previous panel when they're actually kissing. It's, uh, it's just, it feels so... It feels to me like the world is so important to their love, right. you know, and it, and that's how I sort of go into the story in that their relationships are connected to the space that they're in, and that when they're having a moment, everything about the space should evoke that moment. Well, but but also to have romance in a space like that. Right. I okay. guess for some people that's like not a thing. They th- they think like a candlelit dinner, and I think an underground tree lake. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that's a bit different. We should have brought in Red Kubla Khan. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, read on a sunbeam. It's great. It's out there. Hopefully, one day it will see print in like it will. A, a really big, you know, super big Tashin format or something like that. Uh, oh, I did put some more. Oh, that's right. So you I did. Wanted, oh, my smoky panels. Yes. So I, I wanted I wanted you to talk about these two panels because particularly the one on the right was almost unique in the entire run in terms of just the way you broke the panels up and invoking the smoke in the actual division of the panels. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, I felt like I was coming to a moment in the story um, where... No spoilers. No spoilers, I'm not going to say. um, Where the four... You know, I... There was so much intensity that the panels weren't going to do it anymore, that the format needed to evoke the feeling of chaos. And I realized I had been drawing the smoke throughout the story, just, you know, without any idea of what this smoke is or where it even comes from. I just drew it because it looks nice. Um, and I thought, oh, well, now should be the time that I really incorporate it into my layouts. Um, and I don't know if anyone was at the layout talk yesterday, but I did talk about that there, too. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to. No, that's I okay. I can, okay. I can talk about layouts. Uh, so anyway, so I, I found these two panels in particular. The one on the right was, like I said, it almost stuck out going through the whole story. Well, because that's how those, that's, you know, I... This is a, obviously kind of a fantasy comic. None, none of this is real, but I understand how moments of chaos feel. Yeah, I've right, been sure. in those moments, yeah, yeah. and it does not feel chronological, and it does not feel even, and it does not feel uh, balanced. And so I couldn't put balanced panels or straight lines there because that's that wouldn't be true to the moment. Uh, great, fantastic. All right, so we're going to go on now to your diary comics, and this ah. one, three hundred and sixty. How many of them? Did Four, you do? five. Uh, I, I subscribe. I started, I started subscribing at day forty or forty-five. Oh, one of the early birds. Okay. So uh, if y'all know the form, the platform Patreon, uh, I started posting a diary comic every day. It was like uh, three dollars. It was, it was three dollars. It was three dollars a month for a comic from me every single day, which was. Uh, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I thought it was a great deal. It, I thought okay. it was. Well, no, it was a great deal, and it got a lot of people to sign up and, yeah. and follow along. And so, you know, talk about what led you to do it, because this is now something totally different than, you know, it's one thing to sit down and, and 
conceive of and draw a graphic novel or a comic story. Yeah. But now to do this thing that was going to happen every day of your life, okay? <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> um, well, it was two sort of impulses. The first impulse was I kind of wanted the extra cash. And I knew if I offered a comic every day in your inbox from me for only $3 a month, then people would sign up. Um, plus, a, a lot of really generous people gave me a lot more than $3 a month. Um, so v pretty quickly, it became a really helpful uh, revenue stream for me. But also, I had been planning this trip to go to Japan and Germany. And I was like, oh, well, I could make comics about exploring these countries on my own. That, that sounds like good content. And, and the marketer in me was like, and someday they'll collect these and, and put it in a book. Yeah, so unfortunately, we didn't get the mini comic. I know. I was too busy. I'm so sorry. That's okay. So, and, and one, so th this was early on. I think this is like day 40 or something. Day like. 45? Yeah. My glasses are not helping me out here. Yes, day 45, yes. And, and you did change. Now, early on, when you went over to Japan, you got really sick. <laughs> okay. Yes. And you were reading. It's, 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 tell the story about that because it, it impacted your comics in a couple of different ways. You know, there were delays. Oh, absolutely. At, at it was points. the first time I ever didn't post a comic. I mean, I never missed a day. I was very serious about that. Even when I was sick, this is literally a comic of me, I think, being a little sick. I remember drawing this and being like, ooh, while I was drawing it. Um, but no, I got to Japan and I got severely sick um, the day, the day I showed up. Had to come over. He ultimately had to come over. I was hospitalized and alone in a Japanese hospital uh, where they were not helping me to speak any English. You know, they, they didn't get a translator or anything. I, I, I don't know. Uh, it, was, it was just one of the most sort of terrifying and chaotic and also fascinating experiences of my life to be just like... And you speak a little bit of I Japanese. I speak a little bit of Japanese, which was definitely a little bit helpful because I could be like, you know, pain here, um, stop, you know, help, where's my dad? Um, <laughs> things like that. Uh, and... And it totally influenced my diary comics because at that point my, my diary comics had been fairly measured um, and pretty controlled because I, I think that was how I felt. Um, and then it's like, I get to this foreign country, I drop off the map, I, I drop off the map, all my patrons are emailing me like, is she alive? Because yeah, right, yeah. I've never missed a day. Yeah. And uh, finally I send out this weak message like, I'm alive, I'll get, a, I'll get a comic up soon, I promise. And everyone's like, stop, don't post a comic, just rest. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'll get a comic out to you soon. I'm so sorry. Um, and then, yeah, I finally, as I wasn't even fully better when I started drawing the comics of the experience. And I think that, that influenced how they look. Now, you know, going to Japan and going to Germany. So were these done um, analog and you and you scanned? Did you bring ah, antique with you? That I is mean, a great question. Um, okay, and, so and how did this all come about? Because that's, you know, when you're moving around, uh, ugh, knowing, you know. you know, and you're an analog, mainly an analog person. Yeah. It's difficult. Okay? Yes. Because you've got supplies and equipment, where am I going to get boards, ink, you know, all of those things. And then if you go digital, something may get lost. So what did you do? Absolutely. And on a Sunbeam was uh, not done when I went to Japan. I had I did the last five or so chapters of Honest Sunbeam in Japan, so that was also delayed when I was sick, which was another reason why I was very uh, stressed out. But uh, I had two methods. I brought a scanner with me, a small Canon scanner, and it took up all the space in my suitcase. So I really didn't bring a lot of clothes, but I had a scanner. Um, <laughs> But I only really used it when I was scanning in on a Sunbeam pages. For my diary comics, I scanned them on my phone. And actually, even when I was home and had access to a nice scanner, I still scanned them on my phone because it was easier. So I used this app called Scanner Pro, snap a picture, upload it to Dropbox, um, and then I posted it. That was it. These were taken on my phone. Really? Yep. Oh, yep. cool. It's amazing what technology can it do. It is, no, but it's, it was so helpful for me because yeah. it, it made it so easy to share these comics. Um, and it does a really great job of capturing your line art and things like that. So how long were you overseas? Uh, a little over six months okay, by so myself. That's, well, you know, six times three, it's 180. So do you have, how did you schlep all of this paper around? Oh, God, you are not asking me that question. Ricky's no, in the no, audience. No. He knows the answer <laughs> to how I did that. <laughs> so embarrassed. Um, I threw it away. No! <laughs> yeah, the last couple chapters of Honest Sunbeam just don't exist anymore because I, 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 I could not carry it with me, and I was not willing to go to a Japanese post office. Um, I, saved, I saved a couple pages that I liked, um, and the rest of it, the rest of it's know, gone. This stuff's coming across I like, just tossed it. Well, I had so much paper, yeah, man. If she was doing this on paper, I'm sitting there going, but 
wait a minute, what, what Where happened is it? to all the paper? No, like it's, it, not, it's not with us anymore. So most of the diary comics don't exist anymore. And on a sunbeam, yeah. And on a sunbeam? Well, the last quarter. I know. Lost to history. Okay. Somewhere in a dump in Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and you changed. Oh, these are the yeah. I am ill comics. Yeah, but, but you also changed. You got, you know, you got more intricate. You, I think I did. You, you were playing with more things. You were setting things up very differently as you went on. So why don't you talk about um, consciously or unconsciously, you know, what happened to the art when every day you were trying to go ahead and create something new? Well, it's, it's so different when you're in a safe and normal situation. Just at home, every day when I was trying to make something new and distinct, the, the changes were pretty minimal. You know, I'd use pink instead of blue and I'd feel great. Um, but, but being in Japan and Germany, every day felt like both a new adventure and a new struggle. And uh, there was just so much anxiety and newness and, and definitely some fear. And so I was really channeling that into my comics right. where every day just felt so distinct. And it also felt like, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about the difference between diary comics yes. and my memoir uh, in a minute, but, you know, so much about these diary comics felt like I would, you know, do this, I would make this one about being sick and then the next day I would just forget that I had done that and feel like I was right, starting right, fresh, yeah, yeah. whereas memoir feels so, uh, it stays around, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it just, it felt like I also had a lot of energy being overseas and just being, feeling like, you know, this young person in this new place. And I also think a lot of the energy was really being channeled into these, into these drawings. And, and on that, um... Oh, there, there we go. I think that one had color. I don't remember. But the, the, I really, the formats just, I started to lose panels completely. Yeah. Um, and I really just, there was no ground anymore. You know, there's no, there was no, well, nothing solid. And, and I picked these two particularly the one on the left. Yeah, I started painting for about five minutes. Yeah, so, you know, so there were these other things that were coming in. I was like, wow, this is really an unusual one that, you know, didn't, which of these is not like the other? Yes, you know? okay. absolutely, absolutely. Because, and you know what, I felt, I felt so confident in my, my group of patrons that were with me. They were so supportive of me doing these diary comics that I really felt comfortable just exploring when I was doing them. You know, I was like, yeah, I'm going to try to paint. I don't know how to paint, but I'm going to paint, you know, and, just because I wanted to. Right, right. And because there were, there were people around who wanted to see me trying things. And, and the other thing is, is, it's interesting, it wasn't straight diary comics per se so right I suppose the content kind of yeah the content was not like oh I did this today or that today or experienced this I experienced that no it wasn't like that those, it, those can get a little boring actually if you're just like I ate breakfast right so you know some some of these were I had a dream last night or some sure. of these um, were a fantasy about a particular circumstance or some, some were flashbacks, some flashbacks. Um, yeah, exactly. so memories what, I was having yeah so why, why don't you talk about how because most people when they think of diary comics it's like, you know, like James, the standard. Yeah, the standard. You know, James Cachoca did them for many years. And yeah. Many, many people have done them. Some of Pierre does them now. But these were different. They're yeah, just, and I think that's that's a fine way to do diary comics. I just don't think it really suits me. I don't... Part of me also doesn't really want to tell you what I did today. Like, I kind of like to have some mystery to myself. And... And also, what you know, I could have had an interesting experience that day, but what I'm thinking about could have been entirely different. Right. And I really wanted to tap into that. And you know, there was there was one diary comic where I went to the beach, but rather than make it about going to the beach, I went back and talked about all my different beach memories from my childhood that that made me that I was thinking about as I was on that beach today. And I wanted the diary comics to be this sort of fluid thing because when I'm talking about myself, and and if I'm going to let this group of people get to know me, they. They shouldn't just know who I am right now. They should know who I yeah, was and right, who I'm yeah. maybe going to become. You know, I I think the idea of a diary comic should be something a bit more expansive than just what did I do today. Yeah, and and that was one of the interesting things. These these things would come into my mailbox, and you never you never knew what you're gonna get. You never knew what you were gonna get. Okay, and and it was not only about okay, well, what what is she really doing out there? Oh, by the way, is she better? Did she get sick again? All right, did she have a a weird dream that kept her up all night or whatever it may be? But this other stuff started popping up, which made things even more interesting. Yeah, okay. some people said that, especially when I was posting the Japan saga bit, and I broke it up into parts because I'm a drama queen, and I was like, I'm going to only tell them the story in morsels, so they won't know how it resolves till the end. Um, some people were really stressing out. Um, and also my parents are patrons, and they were just like, Tilly, are you okay? Um, but uh, it was so much fun, you know? In a way, it was like writing a book only page by page right. and, and without right. a concept for the book you know yeah. it's as if it's a book about everything 
Right, and, and it wasn't necessarily stream of consciousness either. I mean, okay. I would say some of them were, right. but, right. but definitely not, not across the board. Right, all right. And so, and this, the whole process of doing this as a good segue mm. Mm. into this, which is autobiography. Absolutely. And so before we go into details of the spinning story itself, talk to us about how you saw the difference between diary comics and autobiography. I, I just see them as completely different entities. When I think about spinning and memoir, I think about something that lasts and something that is, I don't know, something something really solid. And when I think about diary comics, they feel like like uh, like the wind, like they, they come and go. Um, the diary comics never really felt totally real to me, uh, to be perfectly honest, but spinning always felt, and, and approaching and attacking a memoir always felt like a very uh, grounded in reality kind of experience. And I right, really right, right. I really had to, I, I, had to, I had to think, I had to really stay focused. Whereas with the diary comics, it was a lot of kind of noodling and like, oh, I'm just gonna do this. Um, and, and I think there is just, just a difference in how seriously I, I took it. I, I don't think I took the diary comics super seriously, but I think that helped them. And I think I took spinning super seriously, and I also think that helped spinning. So they're right. very different, uh, very different entities. And uh, I also think Doing something like spinning is way more difficult than doing something like the diary comics, yeah. but okay. spinning is way more rewarding. Oh, it's, okay. it's absolutely more rewarding. The diary comics do not give give me what spinning gave me. Um, it's a completely different thing. And and when you did spinning, was this something that you had mapped out, or did you go sequentially? I mean, did, did you just like ah. do it the way you draw, which is like, okay, I'm gonna start up here and I'm gonna come down here and that's it? Or, okay, thank you. So, was that um, the 10 minutes? Yeah, that was 10 minutes. We should so. do Q&A soon, but we'll, we'll, we'll do yeah, this. Yeah, we'll, we'll do this real quick. Um, so I, you know, I just wanted to get a feel as to how you, how you structure yourself in the process to get the story out. Oh my God, there was no process. I mean, I really wanted there to be a process, and I, I just I so needed a process, but the problem was I've never done a memoir before. I don't know how to do a memoir, and I didn't want to go ask another memoirist because I didn't want this to be shaped by another person's vision. I wanted it to be my own. And so it started out um, with the advice of James Sturm. He, he told me to just draw scenes. Don't worry about the book yet. Just draw short scenes. And so I did that, and I started drawing these scenes of me on the ice, and slowly I, I had, you know, a hundred pages of these kind of completely disconnected random ice skating memories. And at that point, that was when I hooked up with okay. First Second and my editor Connie, and she was the one who was like, okay, we have this weird, weird misshapen skeleton of a book. <laughs> so... She was, and she was the one who gave me a process because I didn't, I couldn't have a process. I was way too emotionally involved yeah, to sure, come up yeah, with yeah. a coherent process for this book. But Connie was the one who helped. We ordered. We basically took that skeleton, put it in a new order, and and fattened it up. You know, gave it skin right. and bones. No, it already has bones. Um, and, and you know, the interesting thing about this book is, is um, to a certain degree, and there are exceptions like the panel on the right, but the panels themselves are sparse, very and, structured and, and, and sparse, the, and the focus is on the interactions between the people. Absolutely. And there's almost, there, there are some, but the interaction between the people and their environments was not that great. It was, no, it's a very different sort of thing. And I did yeah. On a Sunbeam after I did spinning. Um, but I... So was that in kind of like... In response, in response really. Yeah, you yeah. know, uh, On a Sunbeam was my like, oh my God, I need a break from all this serious nonsense. Um, but I say that with, with all the love for, for spinning. Um, yeah, it's... I, I, don't, I didn't have a childhood that felt worthy of... Uh, of you know big big crazy panels and, and big intricate moments when I when I think about my memories especially of ice rinks ice rinks are really bare kind of sullen places they're usually gray or brown and they're cold and they're big and they're also uh, most figure skaters are in rinks when they're empty so we practice in a lot of rinks with these huge audiences that are just empty and it's this surreal and then you know like that one time a year when you compete it's a full audience but then the rest of the year when you're practicing it's it's empty and it's it's this bizarre ghostly experience and, and you can see that in the image on the right. And so I wanted, I wanted to evoke that feeling yeah. with my panels and with my colors because that, that to me is so tied into ice skating as a sport. So um, tell everybody real quickly about, you know, when did you start ice skating? You know, just give everybody yeah, a little yeah. feel as to what it was you went through because uh, I, I want to ask only one or two more questions okay. and then take Th Then we'll take, que take, take questions. questions yeah. um, Sure, I started skating when I was five or six around kindergarten and I skated till I was 17. 
Um, I was I was a competitive figure skater, which y'all all know what that is, but I was also a synchronized skater, um, which is when a team of girls uh, skates in sync. Um, it's We call it synchro for short. Um, and so I did both competitively and very seriously. I mean, ice skating was my entire existence. I woke up at four and I would skate before school and then I would skate after school um, and compete on the weekends. And I still have a ridiculous ridiculous pile of medals. Um, <laughs> well, and, and as a matter of fact, on that, so, so one of the things I found interesting in spinning was mm-hmm. on, on one sense, because you were young and younger than a lot and some of the women that you were skating with. Yeah, okay, it was. There was a certain amount of tentativeness on your behalf in terms of interacting with people. Mm-hmm. But that really contrasted to this competitive streak that you had in you, okay, that you were like, I'm glad she fell, okay? A little bit. Yeah, it was this weird thing where I was really lonely, but I was also really competitive. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think I was able to both not be a part of this world and also really care about where I was in this world, which is not a healthy place to be. Um, and and ultimately, it's it's sort of what led to the demise and why I why I stopped skating. But but absolutely, there were there was a lot of uh, conflicting stuff going on there. And, and you know, for me, p- part of it was I, I I thought you were taking your you know, your competitive streak was being driven by some of these rejections that you were getting. And maybe okay. it was, you know, and I, and so much, you know, y'all, y'all can read the book and, and decide what you think for yourself, but I think that I put a lot of memories in there that I still don't fully understand, but I don't think I need to, right, because right. I remember how it felt, and I think that feeling is important and worthy of sharing, and so that's enough for me. Well, what we're going to, is, by the way, we could do most probably another 40 minutes just on spinning. Okay? Yeah, we could, we could talk a lot about um, it. So... Uh, because we've only got a few minutes left, um, if anybody has any questions, they can go to the microphone in the back so that we can get you recorded. Don't be properly. shy. Yeah, please ask. I won't answer. She will. I will. I will. Well, maybe answer, depending on the question. Um, so I have a question. How did you decide for the ch- and the start of the chapters of spinning? Yeah. You have different moves. Yes. And I actually, um, my uh, fiancé was a competitive... Uh, ice dancer. Oh my god. So yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I kind of recognized, I was like, oh yeah, he taught me about that one too. So how did you decide where to place the chapters and like what, when to do the waltz jump and when to do all of them sure. in, relevation, relevation, in relation to what was going on in that chapter? So the moves actually, and only a figure skater would really be able to pick up on it, but the moves get more difficult as the book yeah. goes through. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. 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 and uh, I also get older very subtly uh, through those moves. But I really just tried to, uh, you know, once we kind of had the the complete rough draft of the whole book, I sort of tried to pinpoint where there were moments of emotional change. Not just of emotion, but of emotional change when I was going through a shift of some kind. And I thought about, you know, okay, when I'm when I'm young and having a change, it's it's nothing too huge, so it's something simple. So it's something simple like a waltz jump. But when I'm getting older and older and and the changes get more complicated and intricate, it's something way crazier like a double axle or a flip jump or, you know, whatever. I really just tried to and you know, I remember how all those skating moves felt. And so I can really tap into what those, you know, how those can connect to feelings outside of the rink that I was having. Um, so yeah, I just tried to sort of follow the emotional uh, shift. And I also had a lot of help. My editor, Connie, would be like, oh, cool, that's a great move, and it does not belong there. Um, <laughs> we're like, great, we're just going to move that over a little bit. But, but that's the joy of having help in the process. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Next. Uh, hi. What was your motivation for doing an autobiography? Like, why did you do it personally? What was, why did, what was your purpose behind it? Uh, what was my purpose behind it? Um, it was not really an intentional situation. Um, when I was, I was a student at the Center for Cartoon Studies, and at the end of my first year, uh, we showed up to class and they said, okay team, it's your final project, you have to make the best comic you've ever made, and that really stressed me out. Uh, so I went home and I was like, oh my god, I have to make the best comic I've ever made. I don't know what to make, I don't know what to make a comic about. And then it hit me like a bolt of lightning, like, oh my god, was I a figure skater for 12 years? <laughs> no, seriously, like, I, I, when I stopped skating, I shut that down so hard to the point where I was forgetting that, that I had done that for so long because I just didn't want to think about it. And so in that moment, I thought, oh, well, I'll just, my teachers will love this. I don't know if, pe- I didn't even realize if people at CCS knew that I had been a figure skater. I don't think I'd ever even talked about it. So I thought it would be this great uh, concept for a comic and I'd impress my teachers and all that and I couldn't do it, um, which was shocking because I've never 
really, I've never approached a drawing and not been able to do it. Every time I tried to draw myself uh, on the ice, I would start to cry, and I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. And I realized that I had never dealt with any of this, and that obviously, if there was something I couldn't draw, then there was, there was a lot of emotion there. So. I didn't do that for my final project, I did something else. And over the summer between my first and second years at CCS, I, I thought a lot, I talked to a lot of people, and I thought, you know what, screw this. You know, like I am not gonna be afraid uh, to draw myself on the ice. I'm gonna figure out why I couldn't do that. And spinning was my answer to that question. Okay, one last one. Thank you. It's so bright, I can't really see y'all. Hi. Um, I have a very specific question about a formal choice. Um, in, in spinning, the, this is not a spoiler for anybody, uh, no Grace, the, the bully, you treat her differently visually than anybody else. Oh. She's never fully rendered right, or she's yes. cropped or she's That's from the back or anything point. like yes. that. And so I'm just, I have my own interpretation of that, but I'm just curious why you made that choice if yeah. you want to talk about it. I never drew her eyes. Um, that was a really conscious choice. Um, and I, I knew I wanted to render the bully differently because I wanted to really tap into this feeling that you get in childhood that, that you feel like that, that you think adults really can't understand is that when you're, you're, when you have a bully in your life, that it really is this all-encompassing, terrifying experience, and that they really are something different from human because you just can't understand why they would want to hurt you. And I, I also think that. Deep down, I didn't fully render uh, Grace as a bully because I, I think part of me is still a little afraid of her. <laughs> um, and I, I almost just didn't want to draw her all the way. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, and, and maybe in another way, I also didn't think she deserved to be drawn all the way, you know? Screw her, she doesn't get eyes. I get eyes, you don't get eyes. Um, you know, so yeah, but it, it was absolutely a conscious choice. You're the first person to ask me about that, though. I'm glad you noticed it. All right, it. so Mike, well, you'll be the last question. Quick, quick question about your actual senior project. Can you talk about um, how Windsor McKay influenced you and when you uh, with the end McKay? of summer? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, Windsor McKay was just the uh, it was, the end of summer was actually my first book, and I did it while I was a student in my first year. It wasn't actually my senior project. It was just sort of done on the side. Um, but I, oh, I wish I had images from it. This is from spinning. Um, yeah, uh, the end of summer is the story about a family being trapped in this giant castle for a very long winter. Right. And uh, I mean, that's all Windsor McKay to me because Windsor McKay is all about dreams and and landscapes and uh, and the mind and how you can kind of lose track of things. And I really wanted to tap into that uh, with that story and that dreamlike quality and just the simple fact that Windsor McKay draws really great big structures and I wanted to draw some really great big structures. Um, so I wanted to do that, but he was a huge a huge influence on that book, and I think on everything else I do in more subtle ways. One quick thing before we go, say something, because we talked about the, the use of color. Oh, it's, yeah. There's only a couple, not every page has the yellow. yellow. Yeah. Yeah, it's not super coming through on the screen, but if y'all pick up a copy of Spinning, you'll be able to see it. So it is this purplish hue, but then uh, every now and then I bring in this yellow color um, sort of as a highlight, and I chose that yellow because uh, as is happening right now with these spotlights right in my face, uh, that used to happen on the ice where you would have these really huge spotlights all around you, this blinding yellow color, and they would reflect through the ice so you could like look down and see yellow and look up and see yellow. And so I really associated the color yellow yeah, with this okay. extreme motion. So I added it in, in the book, at specific moments to add oh, to great. that. Are Thank we out of time? You. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you all. If you would like to come up and look at this, you, you are welcome to uh, flip through it. I have some time before my next signing. Oh, my signing. Um, at 2.30 at the CBLDF table, I will be signing copies of Spinning. Um, and at, You're going back to Avery Hill Press. Right? I will in a bit. Um, yeah. At table G3 at Avery Hill, they have my first three books, but they may or may not. I don't think they're out yet, but they're very close to being out. So if you want a copy of one of my first three books, Go there now. Uh, if you want a copy of Spinning and you want me to sign it, come by the CBLDF table at 2.30. <sighs> Thank you, everybody.